Story nineteen of Abaft the Funnel by Rudyard Kipling. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Story nineteen The Bow Flume Cable Car. See those things yonder? He looked in the direction of the Market Street cable cars which, moved without any visible agency, were conveying the good people of San Francisco to a picnic somewhere across the harbor. The stranger was not more than seven feet high. His face was burnished copper, his hands and beard were fiery red, and his eyes a baleful blue. He had thrust his large frame into a suit of black clothes which made no pretensions toward fitting him, and his cheek was distended with plug tobacco. "'Those cars,' he said more to himself than to me, "'run upon a concealed cable worked by machinery, and that's what broke our syndicate at Bow Flume. Concealed machinery, no. Concealed ropes. Don't you mix yourself with them. They are untrustworthy. These cars work comfortably, I ventured. They run over people now and then, but that doesn't matter. Certainly not. Not in Frisco. By no means. It's different out yonder. He waved a palm-leaf fan in the direction of Mission Dolores among the sand hills. Then, without a moment's pause, and in a low and melancholy voice, he continued, "'Young feller, all patent machinery is a monopoly, and don't you try to bust it, or else it will bust you. About five years ago I was at Bow Flume, a mining town way back yonder, beyond the Sacramento. I ran a saloon there, with O'Grady, Howlin' O'Grady, so called on account of the noise he made when intoxicated.' I never christened my saloon any high-sounding name, but owing to my happy trick of firing out men who was too full of bug juice and disposed to be promiscuous in their dealings, the boys called it the Wake Up and Git Bar. O'Grady, my partner, was an unreasonable inventor man. He invented a check on the whiskey barrels that wasn't no good except letting the whiskey run off at odd times and shutting down when a man was most thirstiest. I remember half Bow Flume City firing their six-shooters into a cast, and bourbon at that, which was refusing to run on account of O'Grady's patent double-check tap. But that wasn't what I started to tell you about, not by a long ways. O'Grady went to Frisco when the Bow Flume saloon was booming. He had a good time in Frisco, cause he came back with a very bad head and no clothes worth talking about. He had been jailed most time, but he had investigated the mechanism of these cars yonder, when he wasn't in the cage. He came back with the liquor for the saloon, and the boys whooped round him for half a day, singing songs of glory. Boys, says O'Grady, when a half of Bow Flume were lying on the floor, kissing the cuspidors and singing way down the Swanee River, being full of some new stuff O'Grady had got up from Frisco, Boys, says O'Grady, I have the makings of a company in me. You know the road from this saloon to Bow Flume is bad and most perpendicular. That was the exact state of the case. Bow Flume City was three hundred feet above our saloon. The boys used to roll down and get full, and any that happened to be sober rolled them up again when the time came to get. Some dropped into the canyon that way, bad payers mostly. You see, a man held all the hill Bow Flume was built on, and he wanted forty thousand dollars for a forty-five by hundred lot a ground. We kept the whiskey, and the boys came down for it. The exercise disposed them to thirst. Boys, says O'Grady, as you know, I have visited the great metropolis of Frisco. Then they had drinks all round for Frisco. And I have been jailed a few while, enjoying the sights. Then they had drinks all round for the jail that held O'Grady. But, he says, I have a proposal to make. More drinks on account of the proposal. I have got hold of the idea of those Frisco cable cars. Some of the idea I got in Frisco. The rest I have invented, says O'Grady. Then they drank all round for the invention. I am coming to the point. O'Grady made a company, the drunkest I ever saw, to run a cable car on the Frisco model from Wake Up and Get Saloon to Bow Flume. 
The boys put in about four thousand dollars, for Beau Flume was squirreling gold then. There's nary shanty there now. O'Grady put in four thousand dollars of his own, and I was roped in for as much. O'Grady desired the concern to represent the resources of Beau Flume. We got a car built in Frisco for two thousand dollars, with an elegant bar at one end, nickel-plated fixings, and ruby glass. The notion was to dispense liquor en route. A Beau Flume man could put himself outside two drinks in a minute and a half, the same not being pressed for urgent business. The boys graded the road for love, and we run a rope in a little trough in the middle. That rope ran swift, and any blame fool that had his foot cut off, foolin' in the middle of the road, might have found salvation by using our Beau Flume palace car. The boy said that it was square. O'Grady took the contract for building the engine to wind the rope. He called his show a mule. It was a crossbreed between a threshing machine and an elevator ram. I don't think he had followed the Frisco patterns. He put all our dollars into that blamed barroom on the car, knowing what would please the boys best. They didn't care much about the machinery, so long as the car hummed. We charged the boys a dollar a head per trip, one free drink included. That paid. Paid like paradise. They liked the motion. O'Grady was engineer, and another man sort of tended to the rope engine when he wasn't otherwise engaged. Those cable cars run by gripping on to the rope, you know that. When the grip's off, the car is braked down and stands still. There ought to have been two cars by right, one to run up and the other down, but O'Grady had a blamed invention for reversing the engine, so the cable ran both ways, up to Beau Flume and down to the saloon, the terminus being in front of our door. A man could kick a friend slick from the bar into the car, the boys appreciated that. The Beau Flume Palace Car Company earned twenty on the hundred in three months, besides the profits of the drinks. We might have lasted to this day if O'Grady hadn't tinkered his blamed engine up on top of Beau Flume Hill. The boys complained the show didn't hum sufficient. They required railroad speed. O'Grady ran em up and down at fourteen miles an hour, and his latest improvement was to touch twenty-four. The strain on the brakes was terrible, quite terrible. But every time O'Grady raised the record, the boys gave him a testimonial. Twasn't in human nature not to crowd ahead after that. Testimonials demoralize the publicest of men. I rode on the car that Memorial Day, just as we started with a double load of boys and a razzle-dazzle assortment of drinks, something went zip under the car bottom. We proceeded with velocity. All the prominent members of the company were aboard. The grip has got snubbed on the rope, says O'Grady, quite quietly. Boys, this will be the biggest smash on record. Something's going to happen. We proceeded at the rate of twenty-four miles an hour till the end of our journey. I don't know what happened there. We could get clear of the rope anyways at the point where it turned round a pulley to start uphill again. We struck struck the stoop of the wake-up-and-get saloon, my saloon, and the next thing I knew was feeling of my legs under an assortment of matchwood and broken glass, representing liquor and fixtures to the tune of eight thousand. The car had been flicked through the saloon, bringing down the entire roof on the floor. It had then bucked out into the firmament, describing a parabola over the bluff at the back of the saloon, and was lying at the foot of that bluff, three hundred feet below, like a busted kaleidoscope, all nickel, shavings, and bits of red glass. O'Grady and most of the prominent members of the company were dead, very dead, and there wasn't enough left of the saloon to pay for a drink. I took in the situation lying on my stomach at the edge of the bluff, and I suspicioned that any lawsuits that might arise would be complicated by shooting. So I quit Beau Flume by the back trail. I guess the coroner judged that there were no summons. Leastways, I never heard any more about it. Since that time, I've had a distrust to cable cars. The rope-breaking is no great odds, because you can stop the car, 
but it's getting the grip tangled with the running rope that spreads ruin and desolation over thriving communities and prevents the development of local resources. End of story 19